we're going to talk actually about the opioid epidemic. And I know that this has been driven into your brain again and again. And if anyone is not aware of the opioid epidemic, surprise, it's the greatest public health crisis of our time. Uh, but what I want to talk about are some things that perhaps you're not aware of. And I want to take the opioid epidemic, and I want to, you don't have the slides for this, so you can stop looking. Um, that's, it. You have, that's all right. Um, so I want to talk about how the opioid epidemic is not an abstraction for you and I. We're frontline emergency clinicians. We're working in the emergency department in the, in the primary care space. And the opioid epidemic, while we understand that it is a crisis and it is in fact the greatest public health crisis of all time, it kills people. It kills people now more than car accidents, guns combined. It, it kills people more than HIV, asthma, epilepsy. The opioid, opioid crisis, despite the information that we've gathered, remains the most enduring public health crisis of our time. The overdose deaths associated with it, the communicable and non-communicable disease, are all things that fall squarely into the wheelhouse and the responsibility of the emergency clinician. Having an outstanding, thorough, and scholarly interpretation of the opioid epidemic and the ways in which you can help your patient is absolutely critical. And failure to have that knowledge is an abdication of the oath you took when you became an emergency clinician. For all of us, though, who know about the opioid epidemic, for all of us who have seen the statistics that say that 19 people have died since the moment I walked onto this dais, we live this day to day and we live this person to person. For us, the opioid epidemic is not an abstraction. For us, the opioid epidemic is lived day to day, screaming mother to screaming mother, another death, another body called in, another trip to the family waiting room to inform a mother that her son is dead from opioid overdose. We do this every single day and it is not an abstraction. But knowing more about it and being able to do this better will make a difference and will make you a better clinician and it will absolutely save lives. And I have learned this over my years practicing emergency medicine and the ways that I have learned this better than any way else is in talking to my patients, learning from my patients, asking them to share their stories. And in doing so, I've learned so much more about the opioid crisis than I ever could have learned before. And I cannot tell their stories better than they can. So I, once upon a time, began asking them to tell their own stories. Hi, my name's Melanie. I'm 21 years old. I started using heroin when I was 18 years old. My name is Stephen Duffy. I became addicted to heroin in 2013. Hi, my name is Sammy. I got addicted to heroin about a year and a half, two years ago, and I still use heroin almost every day. Hi, I'm Mitch. I got addicted to heroin about a year ago. Uh, I use it relatively recreationally, um, but I'll snort a bag or two every once in a while. I'm, uh, I'm certainly not a everyday user. I'm not uh, addicted, um, but I'll use it uh, you know, every once in a while. Four stories among millions of people that have been affected by the opioid epidemic, four patients who have informed me and taught me about their use of heroin, their use of opioids, and have made me a better clinician and have given me the tools to save lives, have given me the tools to teach others to intervene and to save lives. And we can take their stories and we can learn from them. For example, we can begin with Melanie, whose story is so familiar. She started off and she got injured from playing field hockey and her doctor prescribed her Percocet, a story that we all know and are fairly familiar with at this time. We know that 90% of patients who involve themselves in illicit opioid use begin with prescription opioid abuse. We know, however, that prescription opioids are not bad medications. They're not evil drugs, and when used appropriately, they lead to safe and judicious analgesia. However, 40% of the opioids that we prescribe from the emergency department, from the primary care space, from the operative center, are diverted and are used for purposes that otherwise they should not be. But for all of you who know all about opioid overdose, for all of you who know all about opioid abuse, what do you know about the use of heroin? How do you use heroin? Where do you buy it? How do you get it into your body? What is heroin? What are the risks associated with it? In the United States, the vast majority of heroin comes in a little stamp package just like this. 
It comes, it's usually labeled with a stamp, a calling card, an identifier for the type of drug that is being sold by a dealer, a provider, or some guy on the street. It's used as a calling card, it's used as a marketing ploy. And once a month in my area around Philadelphia, free samples are distributed of a certain stamp. Patients seek out that stamp or identify the certain strengths of certain stamps. And as I work in the emergency department, if I have one person who comes in after an overdose, two, pers- two people who come in after an overdose, it's important from my perspective that I continue to ask, what was the stamp that you used? What was the stamp? Not because I care about one stamp or two stamps, but maybe I begin to care about three stamps or four stamps. And when I begin to identify consistent overdose on one stamp over another, I'm able then to do what I should do and what you should do and what we all should do, which is to notify public health and law enforcement resources to redirect those same resources to target those drugs which are particularly harmful to our patients and get them off the street. Last week, I had three overdoses in three hours off a stamp called Spider-Man. I'm the director of EMS in my county. I made a call. We had DEA resources in the area in an hours, and we got the Spider-Man stamp off the street, and we saved lives. But when patients use heroin in the United States, they generally use white salt heroin, heroin hydrochloride. Heroin hydrochloride, white salt heroin, makes up the vast majority of heroin that is injected by your patients and mine. It's water-soluble. What do you do? You take it, you put it into your cooker, you mix it with your diluent, you heat it up, you put your filter in, you draw the drug through the filter, and you inject it into the vein. Well, there's a lot that we need to consider there. Well, that's important because there's a number of other patients who use black tar heroin, heroin, acetylated heroin. Acetylated heroin, black tar, makes up about 10% of the heroin used in the United States, larger portions outside of the United States. But what's important about black tar heroin is that it's not soluble in water. It requires an acidic diluent for injection. In the United States, this generally means a sterile citric acid packet picked up from the needle exchange facility or the underground safe injection site, or even if you're lucky enough from the pharmacy or even the supermarket where you can get a sterile citric acid packet to turn your diluent acidic so that you can safely inject this into your vein. But so many of our patients don't have access to these sterile diluent modifiers. So many of our patients have to, have to substitute non-sterile acidic diluents to inject their drugs. Where do they find these non-sterile diluents? They find them in fruit juices. They find them in lemons left on the counter. They find them in vinegar that's in the closet in the kitchen. And what's more important is that this practice of using, stero- of using acidic diluents has found its way not out of the black tar community and found its way into the heroin salt, the white heroin community. So many of your patients are using acidic diluents for injection, and failure to ask that question can lead to terrible, terrible results. So what happened with Melanie? Um, Well, I'd gone to the emergency room a few times because my eyes kept turning red. Um, Every time I went, doctors just told me it was pink eye over and over again. I would go and they'd say it's pink eye, but kept being red. It's pink eye. It's pink eye again and again. It's pink eye. And I'm an attending emergency physician at an academic level one trauma center with a billion residents. My evaluation of pink eye consists of me walking through the room like this as the resident writes the note and they kick the patient out. But what we didn't do was we didn't ask the question. Melanie didn't have pink eye. Melanie, who we knew to be an IV drug abuser, Melanie was using non-sterile acidic diluents to inject her heroin. What was Melanie using? She actually lived in a fairly affluent family and her mom every morning would cut lemons for her iced tea and squeeze the lemon in and leave the lemon on the counter and Melanie would come down and take the lemon and use it as the acidic diluent for her heroin before injecting. And why is that a problem? It's because every time she was doing that, she was injecting fungal spores directly into her bloodstream until those fungal spores found themselves to her eye. And that's not pink eye, that's fungal endophthalmitis. And we missed it. We missed it three times when she presented to our emergency department until the fourth time. And Melanie had to undergo a nucleation. Melanie's eye was taken out by our ophthalmologist. Melanie lost her eyes. Nobody ever tells you that heroin can 
can take your eyes. Nobody ever tells you that heroin can take your eyes because none of the clinicians know what it means to inject heroin, how you inject heroin. Our clinicians don't understand that our patients are seeking out the acidic diluents for their injection and they're using the lemons left on the counter by their mom and they're suffering fungal endophthalmitis, fungemia, fungal spinal infections, all because nobody ever asked the question, what are you using to dilute your drugs in? Is it, is it fruit juice? Is it Mountain Dew? Is it, is it citric acid packets? What are you using and why? And then speaking with the patient, hey, listen, I know you're using fruit juice. Do you know that you don't need to do that? You can use water. It's okay. Oh, you're using uh, fruit juice? You're, you're using black tar? Well, let me provide you with the ability to obtain sterile citric acid packets. This is what harm reduction is. All it does, all it is, is starting with a simple question. What do you use to shoot your heroin with and why? And it begins a conversation, it begins a relationship with your patient, and it leads to better outcomes for our patients. Melanie, a beautiful young girl who started on Percocet from a field hockey injury, lost her eyes because nobody ever asked her what she was using to shoot her heroin. What about Bill? So Bill is an attorney. Bill is an attorney I met as a PGY2, and his story is much like many other patients who inject IV drugs. I started to develop a bunch of symptoms, including fever, some other things, and I, I didn't know what was wrong. Went to a bunch of hospitals and doctors, and finally was diagnosed with endocarditis. I um, didn't know what to do. I finally got surgery and a valve replacement heart valve replacement. Endocarditis. And none of us here are unfamiliar with the fact that patients who use IV drugs can get endocarditis, but all of us should be familiar with how we make that diagnosis. And we make that diagnosis, of course, with the Duke criteria. And as you go into the distant memories of medical school or PA school or NP school, you remember the Duke criteria, which calls for any number of major or minor criteria which are combined to make the diagnosis of endocarditis. And what do we use most commonly in the emergency department and in the inpatient world? We look for the condition of IV drug use in the presence of fever, and then we seek out one more either minor or major criteria, either evidence of a vegetation sitting on the valve with an echo or a positive blood culture. So many of these patients are admitted. We wait for an MRSA blood culture, and if it's positive, we presume they have endocarditis. They, pr they proceed further. If it's negative, we presume they simply had a fever, and we send them on their way because we simply cannot do transesophageal echoes on every IV drug abuser with a fever during flu season. We simply can't do it. But the problem is, is that nobody asked Bill how he used his drugs. And Bill used his drugs in a way that 30% of IV drug abusers use their drugs. And he was never going to have MRSA endocarditis. And all along, what did he have? He had a culture negative endocarditis, a HASEC group endocarditis. He had Eichenella carotens endocarditis. Now, why did he have Eichenella carotens endocarditis, because Bill, like 30% of IV drug abusers, licks his needles. And in the, great, in the largest cohort that has been examined in the emergency department, it's been identified that about 30% of IV drug abusers lick their needles. And asked why, responses ranged from answers like, I want to test or taste the drug, or I want to ridiculously clean the needle, or I want to make the needle wet so it slides more easily into my skin, or just simply, this is how I was taught. It's tradition. It's what I do, but what's important is, is that the patient is then exposing themselves to oral microbiota, specifically Eichenella carotens, a bacteria that will never be identified in the typical approach of a endocarditis workup because it's a culture negative endocarditis. And all we had to do was ask Bill. We knew Bill used drugs. Bill was a frequent flyer in our emergency department. He was there all the time. All we had to do was say, hey, Bill, do you lick your needles? And I promise you that if you go out to your emergency departments, you go out to your clinics, and tomorrow you ask your IV drug abusers, hey, do you lick your needles? One third of them are going to say yes. And you know what you need to do to save a life? You say, don't do that. 
you say, don't do that. Don't lick your needles. And you tell them why. You tell them because it can set you up for a heart valve infection that we can't identify and it's difficult to treat. It can set you up for bacteria that we can't identify and are difficult to treat. If you have an IV drug abuser who comes in, licks our needles, and gets a skin and soft tissue abscess, and you don't cover them for oral anaerobes, you did the wrong thing. If you have a patient who comes in with, an, with a, a sub-tissue a soft tissue abscess, you lance it, you start them on Bactrim, and you forget to start them on the Augmentin as well, you did the wrong thing. Because they're exposed to oral anaerobes, but you didn't ask a simple question. Do you lick your needles? One third of these patients lick their needles. It's a simple question to ask. So I've been clean now for about four months, and um, I'm attending a program about three times a week. I think the program's working out pretty well. I'm starting to benefit from it. It's been a struggle, but I think I'm finally getting my life back together. He's finally getting his life back together because his life fell apart, because nobody asked the questions for Bill. Nobody asked Bill, hey, Bill, do you lick your needles? Hey, Bill, what do you use to dissolve your heroin? Is it water? Is it fruit juice? Is it vinegar? What do you use? Because if we'd asked that question earlier, he could have gotten away with his course of antibiotics and his discharge. But instead, he was admitted to the hospital for six weeks, underwent surgery, he underwent pick line, IV antibiotics, lost his law practice, lost his family, his life fell apart but he is now starting to get his life back together with something we'll talk about in a little bit. What about Fanny? So Fanny sort of fit the mold of the IV drug abuser. I think the picture that we all have in our minds of the patient who abuses IV drugs. Fanny would find her way into our emergency department on average every freaking day. With some other complaint, half of it was imagined, half of it was real, half the time she was there for a turkey sandwich, the other half of the time she was there because she was in septic shock. And nobody ever really knew what to do when Fanny came to the emergency department. Every other day she'd complain of back pain and 99% of the time it was because she wanted to get the dilaudid while she was awaiting her MRI because we all know that an IV drug abuser complaining of back pain might have an epidural abscess and might be in trouble. After about a year of Fanny coming in every day complaining of back pain, getting four milligrams of dilaudid awaiting her MRI, the MRI being negative, Fanny stopped getting MRIs until, of course, she got her epidural abscess and became paralyzed. So I had actually gone to the ER a few times. I had some back pain um, and it turned out that I had an infection in my spine because of yeah, she doesn't really talk about the hundred other times that she came in and the MRI was negative, but of course it underscores the fact that these patients are at risk for disease, but Fanny was at, risk for a, at higher risk for particular disease. Fanny had a pseudomonal infection of her spine. Well, how did she get a pseudomonal infection of her spine? Fanny was from the Kensington region of Philadelphia, where a number of years ago a myth perpetuated throughout the community that the water in the top of the toilet bowl was sterile, and that's what she was using to mix her heroin and inject the water from the top of the toilet bowl. And while that's disgusting and ridiculous, it's no different from the patient who turns on the faucet and uses that water to inject uh, inject their drugs. It's no different from the patient who reports that they use bottled water because are they using Evian, Dasani? Is it, is it sparkling water? Is it... Is it distilled water? Is it spring water? What type of water are you using? It doesn't matter if it's not sterile water. None of you would ever inject Dasani into your vein. So how could it be acceptable for us to expect an IV drug abuser to inject anything other than sterile water into their vein? But nobody asked her. Nobody asked her what she was using to inject her heroin into her vein. Hey, Fanny, you're here every single day here in the emergency department. We know as soon as you come in to rustle up your turkey sandwich and begin the, the the, the discussion about why you're here today. Nobody ever asked her what she was using. And would it have been too much of a jump? Would it have been too much of a, a leap for me to say, hey, Fanny, you're back. Hey, I, I remember last time you said that you're using the water from the top of the toilet bowl to inject your heroin. How about instead of that, you take this sterile flush, of which I have 11 billion sitting in the cart here. Why don't you just take this? Just take this sterile flush. It's simple harm reduction. It's a simple question. But nobody ever asked that question. Fanny, what do you use? What do you use to inject your drugs? Mitch, though. Mitch, Mitch, a great guy. I've been with Fanny for about three years. Uh, when she got her infection of her spine and uh, lost the ability to walk and she's paralyzed from the legs down, uh, I helped take care of her. I uh, got her ready, took her places she needed to go, and just, uh, just care for her. 
What, what a tremendous guy. You, you can kind of tell from his picture, he worked as a short order line cook. Mitch is the kind of guy like loved his job. Um, he worked as a short order line cook and really loved cooking for people and making good food. And he would come to the ER and bring like great food sometimes. And Mitch is a great guy, really great guy. The guy took care of his paralyzed drug addict girlfriend right, stayed with her, when, it, when so many other people would have left her behind, right, no problem. This is the kind of guy who has the heart of gold that not only loves his job and is the guy you love to be around and sort of lights up the room around him, the guy stuck by his paralyzed drug addict girlfriend, brought her into his home, wiped her ass, took great care of her. These people are people. IV drug abusers are people just like you and I. It's a stigmatized population for no good reason whatsoever. And when you explore why these patients have the stigma attached to them, when you do a true dive on the history of the stigma and the, uh, the attitudes surrounding IV drug abuse, you find your way back to the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1913. You find your way back to xenophobic practices of the early 20th century. You find your way back to uh, attitudes and, and governmental markers, which are again rearing their ugly head today. But nobody should ever understand anything other than these people are people just like any other people. And they do have a disease, and I know that these people can be extremely frustrating. Trust me, I was the first of many to tell Fanny to get the hell out of the ER when she would pop up for the 16th time in a day following another overdose or looking for another turkey sandwich. Trust me, I'm the first person to tell patients to beat the street when they're in with their bullshit. I get it, and I understand, and I know it, but it's the last thing that we should ever forget that these people are people too. They have families that care about them. They have people like Mitch who take care of them and who do great things for them. And we can do great things for them as well. And the things that we can do begin with harm reduction. They begin with very simple questions. What do you use to shoot your heroin with? Do you lick your needles? If you're doing this, why? What can I do to get you to stop? What can I do to help you? What can I do to make this a better practice for you? What can I do to inform you about what's going on? Hey, did you know that if you use fruit juice, that A, you don't need to, but B, it puts you at risk for losing your eyes. You're shooting fungi right into your eyes. You could lose your eyes. Hey, did you know if you're not using sterile diluents, you could get paralyzed? IV drug users know all about HIV and hepatitis. IV drug abusers know all about abscesses. But do you know about the bugs that are associated with the different practices of IV drug abuse? IV drug abusers know all about the risk of overdose. But do they know about cotton fever? Do they know that if they use a syringe that's been sitting overnight, the filter's been sitting there and they inject it again, that they're just shooting enterobacter agglomerans directly into their bloodstream? Do they know that they will precipitate an inflammatory response from cotton fibers? Do they know that? Do you know that? Are you having the conversation with the patient? Or are you doing what I did as a resident, which is walk up to the patient who had an overdose, say, are you alive? Yeah, all right, two hours, we'll get you going and walking away. Well, what a waste. What a waste where we can intervene, identify this as the greatest public health crisis of all time. And it's on us, it's our responsibility to offer harm reduction and to offer informed therapy and now to take it to the next level, and that is to begin addiction treatment. When we talk about addiction treatment, it begins first with speaking with our patient, developing a, a trusting relationship, and knowing the medications and the, the resources that are out there for treating patients who are addicted to IV drugs. There's a lot of debate around medication-assisted therapy. We know that medication-assisted therapy has Suboxone, and has Methadone, and has Vivitrol. There's a lot of debate and a lot of moralism that surrounds the medication-assisted therapy question. A lot of people who say, no, this is just substituting one drug for another. This isn't the right thing. And I'll tell you right now, if that's your response to this, you're an idiot. And the answer is, is because we know that, that medication-assisted therapy saves lives, and I don't give a shit what you think about if it's right or wrong. What I care about is that I took an oath to save lives. And I know that medication-assisted therapy has been demonstrated in every single study that's looked at it to save lives, to decrease overdose deaths by 82% to retain patient, patients in treatment six times greater than if they're not started on medication-assisted therapy. 
it saves lives. There's no other, there's no further conversation beyond the fact that it saves lives and that's your job and that's my job. Yeah, do I wish there was something better? Absolutely. But am I going to keep a life-saving medication away from somebody because of some misplaced bullshit moralism? Absolutely not. And if that's your response, get the hell out. Stop practicing medicine. You're doing the wrong thing. Medication-assisted therapy, particularly when started in emergency departments at a low threshold and provided to medications, absolutely saves lives. A 65% improvement in treatment reduction, in treatment retention, retention, 53% less illicit opioid abuse. But then there's the ball game right there: 80% reduction in overdose deaths. I am so freaking sick of telling mothers that their kids are dead. Aren't you? Aren't you sick of walking into that room to tell a mom that her 17-year-old baby's dead? You've you got to be sick of it, right? If you've done it once, if you've done it twice, if you've done it a hundred times, one time is too many, and we can stop it. And we can stop it with simple interventions. We can begin medication-assisted therapy in the emergency department. You don't need any special licensing to do so. You don't need a DEA waiver to do so. You only need a DEA waiver to write the script and send them home. Every dose of Suboxone that's provided from the emergency department is a dose of a life saved, as it preventing somebody from overdosing on heroin down the road. Suboxone, buprenorphine, whatever you want to call it, it saves lives and it has a role for initiation in the emergency department. It has a role for bridge to the outpatient environment. And I've had this discussion about MAT induction in the emergency department, I don't know, conservatively a thousand times. And I hear the, I hear the arguments that I don't have anybody to send this to. I don't have, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this drug. I don't want to introduce this drug into the world. Every single one of those arguments is superficial. Every single one of those arguments doesn't take into account what you can do to save lives. Every dose of Suboxone delivered is a dose of heroin avoided. Every dose of Suboxone provided protects from overdose. It saves lives. 80% reduction in overdose deaths. There's no further conversation beyond that number. These people are dying. Uh, so one day I, I, um, I came back and I saw Mitch on the floor. It was before the, the bathroom and he, he had vomit all over him and he was pale as a corpse and, and um, I kind of knew that things were over but I called, I called the ambulance and they came and there was nothing they could do. It is the greatest regret I have in emergency medicine that I let Mitch die. He died about two weeks after I recorded his interview. I never provided him with naloxone. This was before the routine inducement of MAT. This was before I was an X waiver doctor. This was before I had a clinic in which I saw these patients in the outpatient environment and wrote them for Suboxone. And by the way, I don't charge patients to write them for Suboxone. I make no money whatsoever on patients that I start on MAT because it saves their lives, and it is the enduring tragedy and the enduring regret of my life that I let Mitch die. And if you recall back to his original first speech, and he talked about he's not addicted to heroin, he doesn't even inject heroin, he just insufflates heroin, he snorts it. He got a hold of some, some drugs that Fanny had, and maybe they had fentanyl in it, maybe it didn't, maybe it was carfentanil, maybe it wasn't, who cares? He snorted it and he died. Naloxone wasn't available, maybe it wouldn't have helped, but I sure as hell wish I'd either prescribed him or Fanny Naloxone once upon a time from the hundreds of times that I saw them in my emergency department, or when I was at their house with a microphone in front of their face and saw the drug works in the, in the house. It is the enduring regret in my life that I let him die because I didn't know the right thing to do. I didn't know that saving lives in patients with opioid use disorder is easy to do. We know what to do. It's asking questions, it's forming a therapeutic relationship, it's providing access to medication-assisted therapy or, re or naloxone rescue. Saving lives in opioid use disorder is your job. We are the front lines of the opioid epidemic. The statistics mean nothing to us because we see this every single day and we see it from patient to patient. We don't see it from number to number. Ask your patients, do you lick your needles? What do you use to dissolve your heroin? Why are you doing that and how can I help you not do it? What can I do to provide you resources either to do this safely or to not do it anymore? Get your X waiver, get informed on the use of medication assisted therapy and if you have moralistic objections to it, get over it right now. It's a disease process like any other. We don't harass diabetics for eating an extra slice of cake. We don't yell at CHFers because they put two, salts, two, two shakes of salt on their fries. We don't harass other patients for their disease, and we do everything we can to make people better every single time. 
we have abdicated our responsibility when it comes to opioid use disorder. We have taken the Hippocratic Oath and put up blinders and forgotten that these are people just like you and I. These are people with a disease. And what's most important, these are people that we can save. 80% reduction in overdose deaths. We can stop their infections. We can beat back against the greatest public health crisis of our time. And all it takes is to not be me, to not be the PGY2 Rick walking up to the patient after an overdose, give him a little kick and saying, you good? And walking away. All I had to do, all I had to do with Mitch was say, hey, let's talk about your use. All I had to do with Fanny was say, hey, why don't you take one of these little syringes of saline flushes, which are, which are sterile. All I had to do with Melanie was say, hey, lemons for your heroin? Not a good idea, and let me tell you why. And Maybe she'd still have her eyes. A beautiful young girl missing an eye because I never asked the question. Opioid use disorder, the opioid crisis, injection drug use, it's the greatest public health crisis of our time. It's the siren call to emergency practitioners. We have to do it right. And now is the time. Thanks.